Good Sunday morning, First Baptist Church family. Good to, good to meet with you this morning via Facebook live stream this morning. We we'll welcome you to our worship service on this May 3rd, 2020. We are glad that you have joined us this Sunday morning to worship our Lord and Savior again together. And our guest, I want to welcome you this morning. My name is Pastor Jack Andrews. I'm the pastor at First Baptist Church, Newberry, Florida. And we are glad that you have joined us together to worship our Lord together this morning. So we're going to do that in just a few minutes. Got a, a special announcement for, for the church family. Just want to run something by you today uh, and get get you on board what we're doing. I met with our deacons uh, this week and we talked about uh, moving forward, a plan moving forward to help open the church back up. We don't have a hard and fast date for that yet, but there are some preliminary things that need to take place before we get to that point. So we need some cooperation uh, with our folks there and, so, and some patience as well. I appreciate you being patient with us. But the plan is moving forward, when we start back, we're going to start slow and we're going to do uh, two Two worship services. We're not going to have Sunday school, and we're not going to have Sunday night services, and we're not going to do Wednesday night here either. I'm going to continue doing our Wednesday night Facebook message on prayer meeting and Bible study on Facebook, so you can check me out there and join with me. I want to encourage you to do that in our prayer meeting and our Bible studies on Wednesday night at 6 p.m., so that'll be continuing there. But when we do start back on Sunday mornings, we're going to have a, a two worship services. One service is going to be at 9 a.m., and then one service is going to be at 10.30 a.m. A.M. So for the next two weeks, what we need you to do is we're in preparation mode for that. Uh, we need our folks to call the church office on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Miss Mary's in the office those days, and uh, you'll call her and talk with her. Uh, and she's in the office from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. She's at lunch from 12 to 1. But call during those office hours and let her know what your preference is, to, uh, what service you'd like to attend, either the 9 a.m. or the 10.30 a.m service. So what happens is we're going to give you two weeks to do that. If you haven't called us in two weeks, Miss Mary is going to be calling you to find out. And also, if one of the services fill up, uh, we're going to put you in the other service by default, okay? So just be patient with us in that. We need you to work with us in that as, as well. So I want to uh, encourage you in that. Uh, and we will be letting you know about, Miss Mary will let you know um, by sending a postcard out that on the day we're going to launch, that week before we launch, that Sunday coming up, we'll give you a postcard in the mail. But also, Brother Jack's going to put the information on our Facebook, uh, excuse me, our website, fbcnewberry.org. And then also, Miss Jessica will be putting the announcements up on our Facebook page, you see, and you keeping up with us on Facebook. So we'll get the information to you as quickly as possible whenever we do decide to launch. Also, we met with the deacons, and they're, they're, they're excited to help us make that transition. They're going to be here two on uh, the early service and two on the later service, and they're going to uh, help prepare the church facilities. They're going to uh, wipe down the door handles and the church pews uh, with some wipes, and we're going to have some hand sanitizers in place as well. They're also going to uh, block off a few of the pews so that we'll not be able to use every pew, but we're going to be able to sit in every other pew so that we can keep kind of keep some distance there. Because that's why the, the, the um, number is about 50 to 55. Our, our seating capacity here at First Baptist Church is 160 people, so and that's totally full. But uh, 50 to 55 will be good. That we can spread out enough and keep our distance there. When we do start back, that's when we're going to do two services. So all this is in preparation mode and also be for safety measures as well. And we want to make sure all our least, our, our most vulnerable folks are comfortable in coming and worshiping our Lord together as well. So we want to do that. Hey, we're also going to continue our Facebook. We're in preparation mode, planning to do that for our Facebook live services. And Brother Jack, once we get back in full throttle here in the church, we're still going to Facebook the messages, live the messages uh, on Sundays uh, so that uh, those who are sick can watch them or those who are out of town and can't be here, we'll, we'll be able to join us in worshiping our friends and well and guests and those who might be searching will be able to find the worship services on Sunday mornings as well. So we're going to try to continue that once we get going as well. So uh, I do want to encourage you with those announcements. Make sure you call this week, Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday or the following week. And after that, Miss Mary's going to be calling you to find out what service you'd like to participate in as we get ready to launch. We don't know what date yet. I'll let you know as we move forward and, and I will keep you posted. Just stay connected with us on Facebook. Stay connected with us on our uh, website, fbcnewberry.org, and just uh, stay connected with us through the phones as well. 
and uh, Miss Mary sends out emails as well. So we're trying to stay connected the best way we can. Hey, we're going to worship this morning. I'm going to sing a couple songs dealing with the coming of Jesus. Uh, I'm preaching about His coming today. We need to be ready for Jesus to come. And so I hope these songs will prepare our hearts uh, to hear His message today. And uh, I want to open us in prayer this morning. I thank you for being with us. And would you join me in prayer as we pray together on this great Sunday morning, on this Lord's Day, as we pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus today, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the privilege I have to preach your word today. Lord, thank you for the promise that Jesus is coming again. Lord, thank you that you made good on the promise of Jesus first coming 2,000 years ago. And as surely as he came the first time, he is coming again. And Lord, let your people be prepared to meet him. And Lord, let lost people be prepared to meet him. Lord, I pray you would draw people to yourself today. Speak to us, Lord. Uh, speak to our hearts as we hear the message through song and Lord, the message through sermon today. Thank you for those who are continuing to give, Lord. We praise you for, for those who have been faithful in our giving. Lord, bless uh, your church as they give, support your work. And Lord, let us be about your work in Newberry as we labor for you, as we look for you. Lord, as we work for you, as we watch for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first song I want to do is called uh, I'll See You in the Rapture. Oh, hallelujah, I will see you in the rapture. Yes, I will see you in the rapture. I will see you in the meeting that's in the air. It's up there with our blessed Savior. There we go. Savior, there we gonna live and reign forever, and I will see you in the rapture some sweet day. If we never meet again on this earth, my precious friend, and to God we have been true. Up there with our blessings. 
blessed Savior. There we gonna live and reign forever. And I will see you in the rapture some sweet day. Next song I want to do this morning is called The Days of Elijah. Jesus is coming again one day. We need to be ready for him. He's coming on the clouds of glory. He's going to call his church home, meet him, meet him in the air, and we're going to be with our Lord forever, and we're going to come back one day on to this earth and reign with our Lord. The King of kings and Lord of lords is going to reign with his bride, the church of Jesus Christ. So he's coming one day, church. So this song's called The Days of Elijah. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sore, still we are the voices in the desert. is coming again. I hope you're ready to meet him. I want to ask you to take your Bible this morning in 1 John chapter 2 verse 28 and 29. 1 John chapter 2 verse 28 and 29. We'll be reading there in just a moment. And I want to preach on this subject this morning. Being ready for Jesus. Being ready for Jesus. Being ready and prepared means a lot when we face certain circumstances in life. Uh, there's nothing like being prepared. Can I get a witness for that? I mean students, and when you have a big test coming up and you spend time studying and getting the material in your head and thinking about the test and you get a good, night, get good night's rest and then you can take that test with confidence. You can have assurance as you take that test that you're ready to answer the questions. When a man or a woman goes on a job interview and they've prepared their resume and they've investigated the company and the, 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 the position that's open and, what they, and their skill level in that and they can interview and have confidence in it interview that they can do the job and they will be an asset to the company. 
when a football team or a basketball team or some team uh, has practiced hard, when they have watched the films for the other, of the other team and detects their strengths and their weaknesses, and then they get a game plan, and their coach instills this game plan, and they, they practice it, and they're ready, and they're practiced, and they're prepared, and they can play with confidence because they have prepared. There's nothing like being prepared when duty calls. Uh, on the other hand, there's nothing like not being prepared, not being ready when duty calls. When a student has not studied and is not ready, they dread the test, and most of the time they will fail it. Listen, I, have ne I can never recall one time passing a test that I did not study for. Guessing is not a good policy to practice. Amen. You need to be prepared. When a team fails to prepare to get ready, uh, they usually are flat and unproductive. They come out flat and they get rolled over. They get beat because they're unprepared for the game. They play with no confidence and assurance, and they feel ashamed at their output. Years ago, when I was trying to get a job with FedEx as a driver for FedEx, I needed a CDL license, and I had set up the, uh, to take the the exam, I had gotten with my home church, and they let me use the, the church van. I had it all set up, so I thought. I had to get someone with a CDL license to drive me the van and take me to the test. Well, the only person I could get was one of my cousins, uh, Freddie. He lived in Athens about 40 minutes away from me, uh, from where I lived, and, and he worked for UPS. And I was trying to get a job with FedEx. Anyway, uh, the day came that I was to meet him and go and take the exam. As soon as the exam started, uh, I knew I was in trouble. I did. And I was not prepared. As a matter of fact, I didn't even make it to the driving part. I believe I could have passed the driving part. But I didn't even get a chance to make it to the driving part because I failed all the safety tests. They didn't even let me drive. <laughs> I remember feeling bad because I had not put forth the effort to get prepared myself for that exam. Freddie had worked that night shift in Decatur, got, got up in that morning and come to Huntsville to meet me so that I could take that exam. And I was ashamed that I failed uh, and I let him down. Thankfully, Freddie didn't give up on me. A few weeks later, I went back. This time, I was prepared and I was ready for all the tests. And I had confidence because I had prepared and I passed easily. I thank Freddie for being patient with me and being there for me. And there's nothing like being prepared, and there's nothing like being unprepared. As Christians, God has given his word to instruct us and to lead us uh, so that we can be prepared to meet Jesus one day. The word of God clearly teaches us that Jesus is coming back. We do not know when he's coming, but we do know that he is coming. Uh, Jesus can return at any time. There's nothing on the prophetic schedule that has to happen before Jesus comes back. Nothing. Here's some facts about the coming of Jesus. One out of every 25 verses in, in the New Testament uh, deals with the Lord's coming. The coming of Jesus is mentioned 318 times in 260 chapters of the New Testament. The coming of the Lord Jesus is mentioned in every New Testament book except Galatians, 2nd and 3rd John, and also in Philemon. So we need to be ready to meet Jesus. We need to be prepared to face Jesus one day because he's coming again. We need to be ready. So John encouraged the believers to be ready for Jesus by being right with Jesus. And the only way you and I can be ready for Jesus is by being right with Jesus. Let me ask you today, are you right with Jesus? Are you living daily for Jesus? I want to challenge you today uh, and pre pre prepare your hearts and your lives by serving Jesus, giving him the preeminence and the first place in your life, in your heart, in all that you do. Are you ready for the coming of Jesus? Would you have confidence at his coming or would you be ashamed? This text is going to give us some ways that we can be ready for Jesus. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. You read with me in your Bible as we study the Word of God together today. The Bible says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Father, thank you for your Word today. Lord, I pray your Word will not fall on deaf ears and hardened hearts. But God, I pray that you would turn our eyes upon Jesus today. That, Lord, we'd look to Jesus. That we'd live for Jesus. That we'd be watching for Jesus. That we'd be working for Jesus. 
God bless you, church, today. Your people will be focused and be ready for Jesus to come again. Thank you for the promise that Jesus is coming again. And, Lord, get, our, get your people ready. Lord, get lost people ready by uh, them being saved today. Lord, I pray that they would be ready to meet the King of kings and Lord of lords. Bless the preaching of your word today. We pray it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, can, how can we be ready, preacher? I'm glad you asked, because I'm going to see the text is going to answer those questions today. Number one, we can be ready to meet Jesus by, our, our, by preparing to see him. By preparing to see him. We have to make plans to see him, because you and I are going to see him one day. Right now we live by faith and not by sight, but one day our faith's going to end in sight. One day we're going to see Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. How do we do that? How do we prepare to see Jesus? John tells us two ways. Number one, we prepare by living for Him. It's right here in the text. Verse 28 says, And now little children abide in Him. I love that word little children. It's the Greek word technion. It's used of teachers toward their disciples under circumstances that required a tender appeal. And John was uh, like a spiritual father, and he was, uh, loved his children. He was teaching them. He was uh, instructing them. He had just taught them on the importance of uh, distancing themselves from false teachers, deceivers. And by the way, if you listen to false teachers and false teaching, you will not be ready to meet Jesus because they're not going to prepare you for Jesus. They don't teach the truth in love. They're liars. They're deceivers. John says, stay away from them. He said, how can we do that? We do that by abiding in Jesus. He said, and now little children, abide in him. That word abide, John uses it 11 times in this second chapter alone. It's a, it's a key word in the, in, in, the, in the gospel of John. It's a key word right here in the epistles of John. Matter of fact, John tells us in, uh, to abide, it, regards, it, it, it has regard to our fellowship with God. It's the Greek word meno. Meno, M-E-N-O. It means to stay in a given place or a given state, to stay in a given relation or expectancy, to continue, to dwell, to be present, to remain, to abide. This word abide is a present tense word in the Greek language. It describes an ongoing activity and not a one-time event. Did you hear me? We don't abide with Jesus. Well, I got saved 10 years ago, preacher. That's good. That's just the start. You got to stay with Jesus. Listen, we are to continually, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, and year by year, staying with Jesus. It is the will of God. Let me tell you, I don't know the will of God for everybody's life and everything. I don't. I struggle sometimes with the will of God in my life. But I'm, in some areas, but I'm here to tell you, we, know, we can know for certainty the will of God in certain areas, and this is one of them. It is the will of God that every believer remain in Jesus, that every believer stay with Jesus, that every believer abide in Jesus. That's the will of God for you and me, that we abide in Jesus. Wherever he goes, we're going. Uh, whatever he's doing, we're doing. Uh, whatever he's saying, we're saying. Uh, wherever he's helping, we're helping. Whatever he's giving, we're giving. I mean, we just follow his example. We follow his lead. We follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and, and empowered by the Spirit of God. We might abide in Jesus and live for Jesus. Charles Swindoll said, when John tells his readers to abide in him, we know this involves walking in the light, keeping God's word, attending to the foundational truths of the faith, avoiding deception by false teachers, and living lives in conformity with Christ's example, all by the power of the indwelling spirit. That's a good word. Uh, when we abide with Jesus, we are truly living for Jesus. We will only be prepared to meet Jesus and to see Jesus when we are living for Jesus. The only way we can be prepared to see him is for, by living for him. Jesus used this word abide several times in John 15. John records the words of Jesus in John 15 verse 4 and 5. Won't you listen and I'll try to punctuate how many times Jesus used this word abide. Same word. John 15 verse 4 and 5. Jesus said abide in me. And I and you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. 
Is it important to abide in Jesus? Yes, it's important to abide, abide in Jesus. We don't have life without Jesus. We can't be fruitful and grow without Jesus. We'll be sick and we'll shrivel up like a vine that's been detached from the tree, from, uh, uh, like a branch detached from the tree. We'll just shrivel up. We'll bear no fruit. It's important for believers to abide in Jesus. John Philip said the sure way to guarantee being unashamed before the Lord at his return is to abide in him. That is the way to win his approval when the time comes for us to eternally abide with him. We, are, we abide in Jesus by our constant and our conscious surrender to him. In that great hymn we sang, Living for Jesus, written by Thomas Chilson. Listen to these great words. He wrote, Living for Jesus, a lot that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee, for thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. I mean, that man knew what it meant to abide in Jesus. Our living for him causes us to take the next step in preparing to see him. You want to prepare to see Jesus? You've got to be prepared by living for him. Secondly, we not only prepare to see Jesus by living for him, we prepare to see Jesus by looking for him. That's what the Bible says in verse 28. The Bible says that he, when he appears... We may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Our living for Jesus will be accompanied by our looking for Jesus. We are to be looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. The word looking there means to, to be patiently waiting, to be looking with anticipation, to be on tiptoe with expectancy for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You hear what John wrote here? He said that when he appears, John didn't say if he appears. John didn't say he might appear. Uh, it, there, there's a great probability he's going to come back one day. He didn't say that. He said, church, listen to this. He said that when he appears, he's coming back, it's for sure. John didn't debate the fact, but he just declared the facts that Jesus is coming again. John didn't know when, and you and I don't know when. The apostles were not given secret information because they were apostles. Only the Lord knows when he's returning. The apostles were in the same boat that you and I are in today. They had to live by faith in Jesus Christ. They lived out their lives uh, for, uh, looking for the return of Jesus Christ. They were expecting Jesus to come in their lives. So what that? Well, Jesus didn't come in their lives. That's okay. The promise is still there. It's not null and void. I'm here to tell you what does that mean? We need to learn from the apostles that in our living, in our lives, we are to be looking for Jesus to come. Have you seen any telltale signs lately? Amen. Just look outwardly. Amen. He's coming back. He's coming back, church. I'm telling you today, we need to be ready for the coming of Jesus. Jerry Vine said early, early Christians lived in a day-by-day, -day, moment by moment expectancy of the return of Jesus Christ. They believed that Jesus could return in their lifetime. They believed that the Lord could come at any moment. That speaks of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Preacher, do you believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen and amen. I believe in the imminent return of Jesus. He's coming, and it could be today. I mean, he could call me home right now before I get through preaching. Hallelujah. What a way to go. Warren Wisby said this, The fact that Jesus Christ may return at any moment ought to be an incentive for us to live in fellowship with him and to be obedient to his word. I mean, that means that what he's saying there, it should be a great motivator. It's a catalyst. It should be a motivator for us to live for Jesus because he's coming. We're, we're looking for him, and we're living for him. They, they go hand in hand. We're to be looking. Let me remind you of a few things we're to be looking for. We're to look back to Calvary. It's always good to look back to Calvary and be reminded of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ where he hung on the cross. He suffered and bled, and he died for us. Look back. That will motivate you. We're to look within uh, to the spirit that Christ, uh, of Christ that indwells us, that has sealed us, that convicts us, that comforts us, that leads and guides us. The Holy Spirit of God has indwelt believers. Look within. We're also to look around. Look around to other brothers and sisters that are looking for Jesus and living for Jesus and being encouraged by their life. Because when you're living for Jesus, you can be an encouragement to them as well. You and I encourage one another uh, to keep living for Jesus. We're to look around. 
And then we're also to look up. He's coming one day. We're to be looking up because Jesus is coming again. So let me sum that up. We're to be look, we, we are to look back, look in, look out, and look up. <laughs> Amen. Church, we're to be looking up. Back, looking in, looking out, and looking up. And the Bible says in verse 28 uh, that when he appears, that word appears is the Greek word phanero. Phanero means to manifest. It means to be revealed in one's true character. So what does that mean, preacher? That means when Jesus comes, we will see the real Jesus. We will see the real Jesus. There is none like him though there have been plenty that claim to be him, and there have been plenty that told others that they were him, but they were not him. Because when, when he comes back, we're going to see the real Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Forty days after the resurrection, Jesus spoke to his disciples, and then he was caught up in a cloud. He, he, he caught up from the earth. He went up to heaven, and they watched him go up. He ascended. It's called the ascension. He ascended into heaven. And while the disciples were gazing up into heaven, man, they have never seen anything like that in all their lives. And if, if he ascended for you and I, we haven't, even though we've got Hollywood, the fake Hollywood and all this computer-generated stuff, we had never seen nothing like that before. I'm telling you, they, they, they were looking up to Jesus. And then two angels appeared to them in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Listen to what these angels said to the disciples in Acts 11. Excuse me, Acts 1, 11. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. The way he was taken up, same way he's coming back. He was taken up literally. He was taken up visibly. He's coming back literally. He's coming back visibly. We need to be ready when Jesus comes and appears to us. If we're not ready when he comes, it'll be too late to get ready. Church, let me tell you something, friend. If you're lost today, it's going to be too late for you to get ready when Jesus comes again. Get ready now. Hear the voice of God. The certainty of the coming of Jesus should inspire us and challenge us daily to be ready for the coming of Jesus. In the early 1970s, when President Gerald Ford was president, he came to Anderson, South Carolina, it was only the second time that a president that had ever, had ever visited that little town of Anderson, South Carolina. I mean, the newspaper article revealed a sense of anticipation and expectancy from the people of that little town in Anderson, South Carolina, because the president of the United States was coming to town. People were abuzz with activity. They were busy getting things cleaned up and prepared for his arrival. They wanted to make the best impression on the president that they could, so they, they worked hard, diligently uh, to prepare for his coming. If the news of the coming of a president to a town stirs people to action, how much more should the news of the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ stir us to godliness and holiness and righteousness? The trouble is that people there in Anderson, they believed the report that the president was coming to town. People in the world today have failed Many in the church have failed to believe the report that Jesus is coming again. I'm just a news anchor today. I'm here to report to you uh, that Jesus is coming again. Get ready. He's coming again. Hallelujah. Titus chapter 2, Paul told Pastor Titus in Titus 2 verse 11 through 13, he said, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live righteously, soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That blessed hope of our of, and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we're looking for Jesus, we will have confidence in his coming. John is instructing and exhorting the people of God to be ready so that they may not be ashamed when he comes. The word confidence is from the Greek word parousia. Parousia, it, means, it signifies a bold freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. Uh, the word uh, tells us that believers are to be readily and frankly and boldly speaking about their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They communicate their faith. They have boldness, the same kind of confidence we have when he comes. When the Lord appears from heaven we, and we appear before him, then we can have confidence and boldness because we've been ready to see Jesus. We're ready to meet Jesus. 
Every Christian, listen to this, every Christian will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus will judge us according to what we've done in the flesh. Christians are not judged for salvation, but for a life of their, of their service. Do you hear me? Christians are saved. If you're saved, you're saved. If you're not saved, you're not saved. You can't be saved and then lost. If you're saved, you're saved by the power of God. You're kept by the power of God. He saves those who are saved. And they, if you're not saved, you're not saved. We will be saved. Believers will be saved, but the judgment seat of Christ will determine our rewards. Uh, what we've done in the flesh, it will be burned up, and we'll suffer loss. Whatever that means, suffering loss is not good. It's not going to be good because we've, we've done things in the flesh. Those things are going to be burned up. But listen to this. What we've done empowered by the Holy Spirit of God and done for the glory of God, we will receive a reward. That'll be good. We'll receive a reward. You can find that out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 15. I don't have time to go back and read that right now, but you, you can do that and take notes. 1 Corinthians, 11, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 through 15. But we're going to stand one day before the judgment seat of Christ. And many folks will not have confidence at the coming of Jesus because they do not live for Jesus. They do not look for Jesus. God wants us to have confidence at the coming of Jesus. We cannot have confidence at His coming if we're not looking for and anticipating His coming. When I was 14, my daddy bought a restaurant, and we grew up my teenage years in that restaurant. Man, I remember uh, as my dad owned that restaurant, he would have us do thorough cleaning of the restaurant. I mean, you had to clean the restaurant all the time. You, 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 you start out in the morning, then you messed it up, then you clean it up, get it ready for lunch, and then you mess it up again and clean it again, and then at the end of the night, you get it ready for dinner, and you, after dinner, you mess it up and you clean it up again. Then every week, though, we did a thorough cleaning of the restaurant every week. The health department, the health department, were supposed to come once a month. Now, they didn't come every month. But they were supposed to come to examine the restaurant and inspect the facilities and give us a health grade. A low health grade would hurt business. Nobody wants to go to a nasty, dirty restaurant. And eventually, it would cause my dad to lose his license if we didn't get it cleaned up. Uh, so, listen to this. There was times I remember, it, it was an extended time. I, 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 can't, I can remember one time, it had been six months and they hadn't come. And the longer the health department delayed their coming, the more my daddy was on, on pins and needles. Man, all the time he was, he was saying, man, I'd, I'd be after lunch, I'd be wanting to sit down and take a break. He said, get up, clean this restaurant, got to get ready. The health man might come by. The health guy might come by. I wanted to whip that health man. Not, uh, I didn't whip him, but I was like, man, I don't want to, uh, I, I need a break. He's ready. And then the health inspector was coming. And when we had the restaurant clean, <clears throat> when we had the restaurant cleaned, uh, we were ready, had confidence that when the health inspector came, we would get a good health grade. Because we were prepared. Nothing like being prepared. Hey, let me ask you this. More than a health inspector, Jesus is coming one day. And let me say this to you today. When Jesus comes, what kind of spiritual health grade are you going to get? Would you have any confidence that it's coming? Or is your spiritual restaurant a mess? Have you left it in a mess? Are you going to get a bad health grade one day? You don't have to. Be prepared. He's coming again. God wants us to have confidence at his coming and not be ashamed. When we do not live for Jesus and look for Jesus, we do not love the appearing of Jesus. Wow. Jerry Vines tells the story about his love for chocolate. Listen to this great illustration. He said, I don't care what it is. If it's chocolate, I will eat it. He said, one day when I was little, my mama baked a chocolate cake and gave me strict orders not to touch it. He said, that was just fuel for the fire. He said, temptation got the best of me. He said, I decided she wouldn't mind if I just had one piece of that little chocolate cake. So I cut off just one little piece, and it was so good. Then he said, I will, well, one calls for another. And so I ate that piece. And before I knew it, I had cut off another chunk. And before I had finished, I had eaten that whole chocolate cake. <laughs> He said, I had it all over my face and hands. He said, about that time, my mama came driving up in the yard. He said, now, I loved my mama, but I did not love her appearing because he was caught with chocolate all over his hand. Some of you are going to be caught with chocolate all over your hands when Jesus comes back. You're going to love him, but you're not going to love his appearing. We, we, we can have confidence that it's coming, church. John uses a play on words here. In the Greek, he says that God's children should have parousia, confidence, 
at the parousia, uh, the appearing, the Greek word parousia. We should have parousia at the par parousia. Uh, we can be ready to meet Jesus by our preparing to see him. Those who live for themselves will be ashamed at his coming. Those who have denied him and rejected him in this life and were apathetic towards him and didn't believe the gospel, one day he's going to be ashamed of them. That's what he says. Matthew Henry points this out. If you're, here, if you're watching today, you don't know Jesus Christ, listen to this. Matthew Henry said in his public appearing, he will shame all those who have abandoned him. He will disclaim all acquaintance with them. will cover them with shame and confusion. will abandon them to darkness, devils, and endless despair by professing before men and angels that he is ashamed of them. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. We can be ready for Jesus by preparing to see him. We prepare to see him by our living for Jesus, also by our looking for Jesus. Or Ken Hughes said this, Since we don't know when he will return, we should live every day prepared for his return. Remember, we're not on the planning committee but we are on the reception committee. When Jesus returns to this earth, every Christian alive at that time will greet him in confidence or shame. If we abide in Christ during his absence, we can be assured of confidence in his presence when he appears once again. So, we've talked about how can we be ready to see Jesus? How can we be ready to meet Jesus? We do that by preparing to see him. Secondly, John tells us in verse 29, we, we prepare to meet Jesus by our practice of shining for him. By our practice of shining for Jesus. How do we shine for Jesus? Verse 29 says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So John teaches us that we can be prepared to see Jesus uh, by practicing righteousness, by shining for Jesus. Do you know that he's righteous today? John didn't say, if you know, in the sense that they didn't know. They were the children of God. He'd been teaching them the truth. That word if can be translated since, and it makes better sense to hear. Uh, since you know, since you know that he's righteous, they knew he was righteous. Every born-again Christian knows that Jesus is righteous. Everybody. We love him because he's righteous. We worship him because he's righteous. We praise him because he's righteous. We give to his work because he's righteous. We go and serve him because he's righteous. We are righteous because he is righteous. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank God that we can be righteous because Jesus is righteous. John reminds the believers that Jesus is righteous and that everyone that belongs to Jesus will practice righteousness. A righteous life, it is experienced by the believers, but it is also expressed by the believers. It is shown in our lives. Those who abide in Jesus will live a life that shines for Jesus. He changes us when he saves us, and he uses us for his purposes and his glory. H.A. Ironside said he does not justify people by faith and leave them in an unjust condition. But everyone that is born of God doeth righteousness, loves righteousness, seeks to walk in righteousness. We will practice righteousness. That word practice, listen to, is very key word in this text and what John's teaching, very key to this doctrine. It speaks of a continual habit and a consistent life. This word denotes a habitual doing of the will of God. It speaks of a consistent lifestyle of displaying the righteousness of God. Listen, when believers, uh, when believers sin, that is the exception and not the rule. Because Jesus is the ruler, and, and, we, and he is ruling our lives, and our lives are ruled by righteousness, and they are characteristic of righteousness. Righteousness is not the exception in a believer's life, but it is the rule. Uh, we live, we practice righteousness. John gives evidence of those who truly are born again are those who are truly God's children. He says, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Sam Gordon said the bottom line is that the habit of righteousness is the proof of that reality of the relationship. It's a evidence, it's a proof that we belong to him. We serve the Lord because he's righteous and because he has made us righteous. Glenn Spencer said a hallmark is, a defi is defined as a mark indicating quality or excellence or a mark used to stamp gold and silver articles that meet established standards of purity. The Christian's life should be marked by righteousness indicating that God has performed a work in his heart. Has God performed a work in your heart? Is your life characterized by righteousness? Righteous behavior provides a visible proof of being a Christian. Many people do good deeds, but they have no faith in Jesus Christ. 
Others claim to have faith, but they rarely produce any righteous works. Christians would be ashamed to be found with a deficient in either faith or behavior when Jesus returns again. Because true faith always results in good works. Those who claim to have faith and are consistently doing right are true believers. Good works cannot produce... Let me hear this. Good works cannot produce salvation, but they are a re result of it. They are a fruit of it. Uh, they're a proof that true faith is actually present. When we have been born of God, our service for God, our lives for God will be acceptable to God. We'll shine for Jesus. When we serve the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we'll not be ashamed of Him and His coming because we'll be ready. We'll be ready to meet Jesus. When we live for Jesus and seek to take care of His work in this world, He will take care of us. He will take care of ours found this great illustration by Donald Gray Barnhouse. Donald Gray Barnhouse tells the story of a British merchant who was once asked by Queen Elizabeth to go away on a mission for the crown. The man hesitated because an extended absence would hurt his business. And the queen replied, and listen to what she said, you take care of my business and I will take care of yours. While that merchant was away, the patronage and the interest of the queen aroused such an increase in sales of the merchant's goods that he found himself rich and prosperous on his return. I'm telling you, when we get to heaven one day because we've taken care of Jesus, our rewards in heaven, it's going to be great and awesome to be in the presence of God, and we're going to be able to cast those crowns back at Jesus' feet for all eternity. We're going to thank him for letting us serve him. If we've taken care of his, he's going to take care of us, by the way. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Uh, the more we live for Jesus, and the more we look for Jesus, the more we will be like Jesus. Being born of God has definite and abiding results. The word has been born there is a perfect tense verb in the Greek language. Uh, that, that means that children of God will grow to look like God their Father. Our practice is proof of our parentage. Uh, the righteous Savior produces righteous saints. See there in verse 29 again he said, that we'll not be ashamed before him. Excuse me, verse 28. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. We're practicing righteousness. We're becoming more like Jesus. We're just letting Jesus work in us and through us for his glory in the world. We will bear family resemblance to our heavenly Father. Now, when Emma was younger, she's 12 now, but when she was young, she still does this to a great degree. But I mean, when she was younger, she tenaciously clung uh, to her mama. I mean, all the time, Tracy couldn't go anywhere, do anything without Emma. When Tracy left her with me, Emma cried and bawled for her mama. She looked for her mama's return. She couldn't wait for mama to get back. She was attached at the hip, son. I'm telling you, Emma bears family resemblance, by the way. If you look at her, she looks like her mama. Uh, Tracy couldn't deny her if she wanted to. Thank God she don't want to, but she couldn't deny her if she wanted to. She looks like her mama. That's the way it should be with us in our Christian life. We're to look so much like Jesus that the Father in heaven couldn't deny us. Then, oh, that one belongs to Jesus. That one belongs to us. He looks just like the Son. He's modeling the Son. He's got the same attitudes and actions of love and labor of the Son of God. He's been conformed to the image of the Son of God. He bears family resemblance. Listen, you can't bear family resemblance if you have not been born into the family. You can't work it up. You can't say, well, preacher, I'm trying. I got another code of do, do good and do better. That's not going to help you. You've got to be born again. Notice what John says here. He says that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So the opposite of that is that those who do not practice righteousness have never been born of him. Born-again Christians, that's the, that's the rule of their lives. They are practicing righteousness. They love righteousness. They love godliness and holiness, those things that God loves, God's Word. And by the way, we've got a generation today that hides behind the cross, that comes into buildings and calls themselves a church, and yet they approve of ungodliness and an abomination to God. And they call themselves the church. They're not practicing righteousness. They don't love righteousness. Why? Well, John says, because they've not been born of him. If you've been born of God, you're going to practice and love righteousness, and you're going to be righteous, and you're going to seek to do righteousness. 
Are you ready to meet Jesus? Do you live every day expecting Him to return? I wish I could say I did that every day. I, I wish I could say that. There's days I don't, I don't live like I should. There's days I don't expect Him to return. I'm not looking like I should. So what do you need to do, preacher? I need to repent. Those days I'm, I'm, I'm lackadaisical, that I'm short-sighted, that I'm not seeing as Jesus sees, and I'm not following Him as I should. I need to repent. And by the way, repentance is a good word. God calls for the church to repent. When there's true repentance, there'll be true revival in the church. The church in the 21st century has lost focus, and therefore we've lost faithfulness. Uh, we've lost focus on that uh, blessed hope that the Bible calls the coming of Jesus. We need to encourage one another with the fact that Jesus is coming again. I hope I've encouraged you today uh, with this fact that Jesus is coming again. Church, I hope you've been challenged. And I hope you repent. If you're not looking for him and living for him and laboring for him and watching for him and working for him, I pray you would repent. We need to spur one another on to love and good works and righteousness because he's coming again. We need to be ready and we need to let others know so that they can too get ready. They can be ready. If you're not ready today to meet Jesus, you can be. You can right where you are. You can be born into the family of God, and you can bear family resemblance. When you're born again by the Spirit of God, He's going to work, do a work of grace and power in your life. He's going to conform you. He's going to not beat self out of you. He's going to beat self out of me. He's still working on me, by the way. And He's going to be working on us until He comes and gets us one day, until we're perfected in heaven. We're not perfect. Nobody is. But we, are, we have Christ in us, and He works in us, and He works through us, and we surrender to Him, and a life of righteousness is characterized in our living. If you're, not, if you're not ready to meet Jesus today, you can today by repenting of your sins, by confessing your sins to Jesus, by asking Him to forgive you. He's done the work for you on the cross. He died in your place. He took your punishment so that you could be saved. So what I do need to do to be saved, trust Him. Have faith. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Say, so I don't know how to have faith. You have faith every day. You have faith in your car. You go out and put the key in it. And you crank that up. You get on an airplane and fly. You have faith in that airplane. You have, you have all kind of faith in things you don't even think about. You need to have a conscious faith, though, in, in this, in the Son of God. You need to have a conscious faith that uh, only He can save you. And I'm not doing it unconsciously. But I'm coming before him, and he's the only one that get, can, can save my soul and get me to heaven. And he, he will prepare your place for you in heaven. And he will come back for you one day and get you. One way or the other, we're either going to Jesus or he's coming for us. We're going to him by the way of death or he's coming for us in the clouds. We need to be prepared to meet Jesus. Are you prepared today? Ask him to cleanse you, give you eternal life then you can be ready to meet Jesus. Christian, I want to ask you today, are you really ready to meet Jesus? Are you living and practicing righteousness? If righteousness does not characterize your life, you need to do some self-examination as to whether you are in the faith, whether you've been born again, whether you have been born of Him today. And let us live a faithful and consistent and a joy-filled, fruitful life for the Lord Jesus as we prepare to see him by practicing in this world, shining for Jesus. We're prepared to meet Jesus by preparing to see him, but also by our practice of shining for him, living for him and looking for him. If you're, you're, you've watched today and you say, Preacher, I, I need to get prepared today. I need to be saved. How can I do that? You can do that by trusting in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You call upon the name of the Lord Jesus in faith today. In your faith, you can call out to him, Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I know that my sin has separated me from you. And I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I ask you to cleanse my heart. And I ask you to save my soul. I trust you and you alone, Lord. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I believe that you were buried. And on the third day, God raised you from the dead. And I believe you live forevermore. I believe what that preacher preached about today. That you came 2,000 years ago to save the lost. And I believe that you're coming back again. And let me be ready to meet you. And I trust you today, Lord. And I surrender my life to you today. And I thank you for saving me today. I call on your name in faith. 
in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer today and you've trusted Jesus Christ, we'd love to hear uh, from you. You can contact our church office. Our, our area code number is 352-472-2351. 352-472-2351. You can email me at, at PastorJack1213 at BellSouth.net. Brother Jack, I have that on the screen for us as he did last week. appreciate him doing that. And you can contact us and we can get you some information about what it t means to be a follower of Jesus now. You've been born again. You need some help in your new walk. We can get you some information on what the next steps are and how you can grow in your faith and follow Jesus in believer's baptism. That's one of the very first things he commands us to do, to testify outwardly and publicly what he's doing inwardly in our hearts. So I encourage you today to do that. Follow the Lord. And I want to encourage you, saints to, of God today, contact me. Let me know how God's worked in your heart as well. Say, man, Pastor, I've not been living like I should, or, or I just got my eyes back on Jesus. Thank you for preaching this message today, and I want to rejoice with you today. And I'll be rejoicing. I hear any news like that, that we've got our focus back on Christ, and we need to be prepared to meet Him because He's coming again. Be ready, church. Be ready. Be living. Be laboring for our King. And let's live a life of righteousness. Not something we can work in, but what Jesus works out. Let's just surrender to him afresh and anew. Hey, I want to encourage you to be back with us Wednesday night at 6 p.m. on Facebook. I'll be doing a Bible study and prayer meeting. If you've got any special prayer requests, and you can type those in the message box, and I'll see those, and I'll intercede for those needs as well. So I want to encourage you to engage with us. As we cannot come together right now physically, we can still, like we're doing today, we can still be connected. We can still hear the Word of God. We can still pray together, and we can still interact. Uh, even though I can't hear your voice, you can type in and message me, uh, and we can pray together for you on Wednesday nights. Next Sunday, we'll be back, Mother's Day. Hey, don't forget Mother's Day. Don't forget Mother's Day, amen. Make sure you get your cards in the mail or, or make sure you're able to do something special for Mama. And I know our circumstances are, are rough right now. We can't go do everything we might want to, but we make sure we love Mama and tell her we love her and we thank God for Mamas, amen. I um, thank God for my Mama as well. That was a reminder for me, not just for you as well, all right? Uh, I want to close this in prayer. Thank you. I love you. I appreciate you joining us today. And let's pray together. Father, thank you for the promise that Jesus is coming today. Uh, again, Lord, thank you that you reminded us of that promise that Jesus is coming. And Lord, we believe he's coming soon. And let, let us, like the apostles, live out our lives in expectancy of the return of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we, we know what... We know beyond a shadow of a doubt, Lord, either we're going to go to you through, through the way of death or, Lord, you're going to come back for us in the clouds of glory. So let us live each day like it could be our last day. Let us live for your glory. Lord, would you produce righteousness in your people, Lord, in our hearts, that it might be shown in our lives, that we might look for Jesus, that we might labor for Jesus, that we might work for Jesus, that we might watch for Jesus. Bless your people today, I pray. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.